Greetings, darklings, from across the interwebs. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken, here for the Sounds and Shadows podcast. I have an extremely exciting guest that we will be getting to and talking uh, about soon. Man, I, this is going to be another good one where we have a lot of history to discuss and a lot of fun things. Um, but first off, uh, I'm going to do self-promotion. We got today, I got in the new design of the Sounds and Shadows t-shirts that I am uh, rocking here that you can uh, get one of those to support us. Um, the original design was by uh, Jim Marcus of Go Fight and uh, a little band called Die Warsaw. Um, and then this was redone by our friend uh, Pearl uh, over in uh, Israel. And super cool. I really like the chain look kind of because that's the whole thing of Sounds and Shadows. We're we're bound together to make each other stronger. So that's very exciting. Uh, the other thing, we had a new actor's video drop today. Um, so that is something that everybody should go check out. It's over on the Suns and Shadows page shared there. Um, and recently, we had a article come out that I posted a review of something that was very near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was growing up, it was a ritual to me. It was an important thing in the days long gone when we didn't have Google searches and Bandcamp and Spotify to find new music. At 15, 16, I would pedal my bike up to the local uh, CD record store and I would go find the Cleopatra samplers that would come out. And this was really important to me because there wasn't another way to really find new bands in areas beyond your own that you didn't know about. And I would come home, I would light some black candles, I would smoke a clove cigarette. It, it was a big deal. And recently, we had the chance with Amaranth to be on one called The Unquiet Grave, the final chapter put on by Procession Magazine. So I really encourage you to go check out the article, but to help out in talking about this and getting together with it, I am extremely excited to have uh, Ethan Morales of the band Noir, but also several other bands that we're gonna talk about. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 has been a huge part of the dark wave uh, goth scene for a long time. Ethan, a real pleasure to have you on with us. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. And, I, and again, you know, I, I read your story uh, uh, about, you know, how you discovered music and you just retold a part of it. And uh, I love those kind of stories because, I mean, that's how, you know, when you, when you get into underground music or at alternative music, whatever you'd like to call it, um, especially in that era, 80s, 90s, it was, I mean, it was a full-blown hobby. In fact, in some ways, it was a lifestyle, you know, I mean, it, you, it you, were, new stuff. Yeah. you were looking for hard copy zines, you were looking for, it was a lot of word of mouth, um, you were flipping through the bins, looking at, you know, at, of course, then primarily CDs, I guess some cassettes in the 90s, uh, but not really any vinyl. And, uh, and again, that's how we found out about bands. So yeah. it is true that vinyl had fallen out of fashion. And I always, it's funny, it's a very embarrassing story, but I, uh, I was one of those that thought CDs were a fad. I think I bought my first CD player in like 1996. I thought it was going to pass by and felt foolish. So when mini disc players came out, I went out day one and got like the best one money could buy and converted everything I had onto mini disc and released Amaranth's first out on mini disc because this was going to be the future. And, and then I missed on it again. I'm really not good at uh, hardware and media for guessing what's going to appeal to people and what is. Yeah, I don't know if anybody is. I mean, I kind of lucked into, you know, I kind of lucked into this vinyl thing only because I, I had had a big collection from the 80s. And so, sure. um, and in the 90s, vinyl was really cheap because, you know, like, I think around, I guess around 92 or 93, they had started phasing it out and the label started phasing it out. And a lot of people were thankful because it was even expensive then. Sure. Um, but I hung on to my records. Um, I had put them in storage because I had moved to LA. 
So um, I, I really, I had been away from them for about 10 years. And so when I moved back to New York, I cracked open those boxes and I thought, wow, this is great. Um, so I was really glad, but I, it was only by, by luck. I probably would have bought a Betamax. I probably would have made a lot of mistakes if I had a few bucks back then. So. Well, I love vinyl too, and I love the resurgence of it. And, you know, we talked about this, uh, actually, uh, I interviewed Christian Death uh, a few weeks back, and that was kind of one of the things that we discussed is, I don't know, there, there's a lot of dispute about the song, sound quality and what, you know, the difference. But to me, it's more, it's the ritual. When you got a record, you're, you're holding it, you're smelling it, you're taking out the liner notes, letting the needle drop. I don't know. There's just, there's something about that that's special, especially when you're sharing it with people. You know, you have some people over to your house, you open a bottle of wine and you say, have you heard this record and put it on? There's a magic about that that I think, I don't know, is, is a bit lost in our new digital era of plugging in your iPod, you know? I agree with you, and I've, I've kind of felt something similar uh, over the years. I mean, especially when 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 the artwork is good. I yeah. mean, you have like I don't know when I like the first Bowie studio album I, I I think I ever owned was Diamond Dogs, and to me, I, I was immersed in this in the artwork for the for the cover. It was like a sideshow thing, and you know, Bowie is uh, is sort of half man and yeah, half like laid out, like, you, you know, know, kind of yeah. And, so, and there is, there's something special about that. And, and that album in particular, it definitely has, I don't know, a power because of him, because of a lot of the barriers it was breaking in pop music. You know, some of these things would maybe happen on the edge a little bit, but Bowie, I don't know, being out there like that, you know, shirt off and kind of part done, I, I think did, was definitely for its time period, a barrier breaking thing for pop music. Oh, for sure. And again, I mean, just the, I mean, obviously you can, you can do a search online and find the lyrics of just about anything, yeah. but, but there's something very immediate about opening up a gatefold, if, even if it's not a gatefold, and you slide it out and the, the lyrics are on the inner sleeve and, you know, who produced it, and you start to become familiar with these names. And I think it's all part of sort of the, the ritual of music, you know, when, when, and, and again, just even using Diamond Dogs as an example, from a very early age, I, I guess I even found out that that's the only Bowie album where Bowie plays all of the guitar. Yeah. Well, not all of the guitar, but most of the guitar on that record, the, the spiders had broken up. And right. so Bowie, now I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't looking, you know, at the credits. And so you know, I always knew that about that album. And it's funny that, you know, now, 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 now Bowie's gone, but he never really returned to play, playing the guitar. He always got like hotshot guitar players like Steve Ray Vaughan and Robert Fripp, and he always got big names. Um, but on that album, it's him. See, that was something I always respected, though, about Bowie is like you're saying, getting the hotshot, because I would always hear something say like an Eric Clapton album. And I would think to myself, Brother, you could call John Lennon right now and he would pick up the phone. You could, but you decided to sing on this yourself. Like, why not bring in the person that you could bring? And I always kind of, it bothered me that I'm like, your voice is fine, my guy, but come on, you could have got anybody. Right. You could have got Paul McCartney <laughs> to sing this, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> but I like that about Bowie that he, as good as he was, he said, I'm going to put the best person possible in here to play this lick out. So, wow. Well, I always think with him, they, 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 I, I've come to the conclusion now, this is just my own conjecture on him, but I think that Bowie would surround himself with different people, which would almost make each album and his voice different on each record. Because he, he wanted each record to be different. And right. granted, it wasn't like there was a different guitar player on every album, but he would move these chess pieces around and have these sort of random people play on records. And I've kind of, the reason I'm even talking about this, because I've kind of pinched a little element of that with my project Noir. And I feel like by inviting different people to become part of it, it, it almost forces me to kind of look at things a little differently. And so I, one of the many things I 
pinch from David Bowie. But again, it, it, you're going to steal and, from somebody. Steal from Bowie, by all means. I mean, even even in the years I was in Black Tape for a Blue Girl, it, it's something Sam Rosenthal does too. I mean, he he's constantly got a revolving door of people in the band, and I think it makes each record sound a little different. So, yeah. and I think it also puts you in a different, uh, you know, in a, in a different mind frame making the record. So maybe that's kind of what Bowie had in mind. I mean, even if you go back long before Bowie, I mean, a lot of the greats did it too. So um, they, they did have favorite people that they went to, but, but for the most part, I mean, even if you go back to like Sinatra records and like they actually had different people on those records to, to try to take them in different directions. So I've stole that technique too. I love it. I also love that we just got into this conversation. I can tell already what a, a fun interview this is going to be, just all the places that we're going. But I think we need to talk about you a little bit. Um, I, I'm aware and have done a, a deep dive on some of your history and impact on this scene. Um, wearing a lot of different hats in a lot of ways, but not all of our listeners may know as well. So can you start out telling me a little bit about going back to, I mean, because you were almost kind of like a child prodigy actor in this, uh, in the sense that like Fahrenheit 451, you were what, 16, 17 or something? Yeah, when you, but you were very young when you kind of started this scene and singing in it. Um, tell me a little bit about your history in music, some of the bands that you've played with and, and worked with, and bring us up to, to present with this project uh, with Noir as quick as you can, because there's so much there. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, if we go back to the 80s, and, and, and again, this is sort of a subjective thing, but I think that there's been different waves of dark music as a whole. We'll just call Always. it that. Um, so I feel like I kind of came in at the end of the first wave, mm -hmm. which is sort of like um, Proto to 84 yeah, or somewhere in that time period. I, I was kind of coming up. So, I mean, uh, again, taking that, that sort of, I kind of started with The Doors. I mean, they were one of my favorite bands when I was in high school. And I always say that they kind of led me to discover dark rock. Um, I say specifically Ray Manzarek, but I agree with you 100%. Yeah, it just, it's, it, there was really, I mean, there, there's traces of it in other music at that time period, obviously the Velvet Underground, but I certainly wasn't cool enough to know the Velvet Underground in high school, or even know their music, I mean. Um, that was, that happened a bit later. Sure. Um, and I, it didn't necessarily lead me to Bowie, but, but, it, but again, in that time period, I kind of find Bowie, and so those, two are sort of my my guiding force sure and um i remember sometime in 1983 seeing the hunger for the first time yeah um, susan and, brandon bowie opening with yeah, awesome. everything is is in that movie and i remember seeing you know here's bowie in the nightclub scene and then here's this mysterious band behind this fence on the stage and it's you know all every every element that I love, like hammer films and, and dark color and all these things kind of coming together in this sort of Euro thing. And I said, I want that. And so um, by the time I finished watching the movie, I discovered that Bounhouse had already broken up. So I, I really came in like right in that <laughs> moment. So sometime in 84, late 84, I took steps towards uh, starting Fahrenheit 451. And um, again, we were, I, I did an article or an interview earlier today where I was kind of trying to explain that we didn't even call it goth then. It didn't even have a name. I mean, it was just, it was post-punk, it was underground, I don't even know what, and it was all sort of in a stew together because you would go to a nightclub like Danceteria and you'd see, I don't know, Red Lori, Yellow Lori, and it, there would be a hip hop act on the same bill. Like it was just, it was all sort of alternative underground music. And we, we had such a small portion of the pie that nobody had like splintered off and started genre names or anything at right. that point. So I started Fahrenheit with just like, I like Bowie, I like Joy Division, I like Bauhaus, I like Susie, let's, let's start a band. Sure. And, uh, and so 
Fahrenheit, you know, we had our thing in the New York area. We were New Jersey based at the time. We played in, in New York a lot. We played in Philadelphia a lot. We played everywhere for the two and a half years. We put out a really strong record in 86 called House of Morals. And, yes. and so all of my... Hold on, we gotta, take a, we gotta take a pause real quick. Okay. This is one of those that I, I came to late where I went and discovered House of Morals. If you have never heard of this album, I know you're going to be modest about it right now. People need like to have a, a full appreciation of the history. I did the same thing kind of when I was talking to Rodney Orpheus, uh, Cassandra Complex. Sure. Take a moment. It's, it's on Bandcamp on Remaster now, I believe. Go look up this album and listen to it and understand how much impact that had on everything in goth that happened afterwards and i'll say it so you don't have to it's something that you need to do as part of your understanding goth roots education okay unpause go ahead now <laughs> thank you it needed to come from me I, I felt like so that people would appreciate so we so that was a kind of a funny time period that 85 86 i feel like the first wave was kind of ending yeah. and the bands that had established themselves that were still together and were successful, the Sisters of Mercy, Susie and the Banshees and bands like that, Killing Joe, they would come to the States and they were starting to play really big rooms, but nobody gave a damn about American bands with a similar sound or, you know, a compatible sound, let's say. And so the only band in the States at that time period that really had any kind of um, any kind of following outside of where they were from were, were Christian Death, right? Um, and they had already, you know, broken up, restarted, and you know, <laughs> done a bunch of different things by that point. I think at that point they're probably like maybe doing Ashes or one of those records. Yeah. But again, that was still kind of like a West Coast death rock thing, and it really right. wasn't. It really wasn't a net. They were bigger in Europe than they were in New York. So right. like it, they, they probably played New York a few times. I never managed to see them then. But there, were, there was a band like, the, like Fahrenheit 451 in just about a, you know, a dozen other cities. You had Strange Boutique in DC. You had Shadow of Fear in Cleveland. Um, there was another band in New York called Ovamesh that were really good. Um, and everybody had an album out or an EP, and we were all trying to kind of create something. Yeah. But um, it was kind of typical of, 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 of how things went. People went to go see the sisters, but they didn't care about more of an underground, uh, uh, a band that, let's say, was in that same world, but was more of an underground act. So sure. it was hard to really get any footing. But we did our thing. We opened up for Alien Sex Fiend. We opened up for Gene Loves Jezebel. We opened up for Specimen. So we were opening up for like a, sort of the second wave of bands, Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, those kind of bands that were obviously not as big as the Sisters and Susie, um, but they were more club acts. And so we, we latched on to a little bit of that. Um, but I, I feel like our sound was starting to change. It was 1987, the harder stuff was coming in, industrial, and, and we kind of imploded. And I moved to Philadelphia and joined a band called Executive Slacks. And so I, uh, I was in Executive Slacks for three or four years and I learned a lot. Um, and again, it's sort of a, another crazy time period in my life, but um, we opened up for, we did uh, unbelievable. Uh, um, I'm trying to think, Jane's Addiction, um, um, uh, Fields of the Nephilim, um, um, ooh, I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but we, uh, The it's Mission, okay. KMFDM, we opened up for so many acts, it was insane. Yeah. Um, and we did a lot in the, the sort of Northeast, we, you know, played the coast, we went out to California and, and played Helter Skelter, which was a great moment for me. Yeah. And then I got the bug to move to L.A. Um, and so this is like about 1990, 91. Um, I had a couple other projects, this and that, but I thought it was really time for me to go to LA and get very serious about music. Sure. So I moved to LA and by chance, while I was in LA very early on, um, I moved there in 92, a friend of mine had started a band called Spawn Ranch and they were looking for a singer. 
Yeah. Um, and they had put out an EP, like a, like a three or four song EP with, with a different singer. Um, mm -hmm. And they were looking for somebody to tour with. I had known Matt Green and Rob Morton from my days in New York. We were good friends. And here we were all in LA together. So I, I joined Sm Spawn Ranch and uh, we, we got signed to Cleopatra and it kind of goes from there. So Spawn Ranch is really in the 90s. I mean, we worked really hard, but we put out, I think, five studio albums in seven, eight years and uh, a lot of EPs, a lot of remix things. We did at least a dozen tours of the US, two or three tours of Europe. I mean, we really worked very hard. Um, and then at the same time, I started working at Cleopatra. So I started kind of applying a lot of the techniques that I use to promote my own music. Um, and I started to put them to use at Cleopatra. So my whole, I used to say that I, I'm doing the music industry from both sides of the desk. You know, I'm sort of a client and I'm a, I'm a record company guy. So like, or I'm an artist and a record it's a member. I'm also a client. Right, right, exactly. I remember that commercial. Um, but uh, so I, I it, it really, I mean, in, in some ways, it kind of built who I really am. I mean, it really, it, it helped me to kind of understand the, the, the different parts of the music industry while working in it, but I was also creating in it. And so that went on for most of the 90s. And so it's like true to a point very much now, like the name of the game now is you is DIY. You have to so much wear a lot of hats in bands. And I think that's true. It's always been true to a point, but I think now more than ever, it really takes doing, you know, where you have a guy who's good with business in the band. You have somebody who's good with promotions. I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, you have to have that in order to succeed. You can't just get away with, we made a good record, so obviously people are just going to buy this now. And, I mean, and some people can get away with it, but very few. Sure. And, and, and it, it's, it's funny, like, as much as the game has changed, it kind of remains the same in some ways. But, but sure. one thing that's, that's very true is that although you could record an album over a weekend and on Monday morning pretty much put it up online if you want to. And so right. it, some of those things are easier. So in a sense, it's one step forward, but then it's also one step backwards because there's a thousand other people doing the same thing that day. So exactly. the competition but is insane. It, it is, it is. And, and that's why you have to find, yes, yeah, some way to, to make yourself stand out. So what I was gonna ask you though is, in that time period, you know, you're talking about when you first came over in LA to Cleopatra, I kind of talked to you about what that meant to me and what a big deal it was for me, you know, being a few years younger than you. What did it mean for you, Cleopatra Records, in, in those days when you were kind of doing this in a part of both sides, both playing music and whatever, if you want to call it, the, the executive side of it or what have you. Um, what did that mean for you building with Cleopatra Records and kind of when goth was a thing now? It was a word, it was a concept, it was an idea. And Cleopatra Records, more than just about anything else, was the forefront of that early putting it into a real tangible thing called goth music that was striking a chord with people and being meaningful. What was that like to be a part of that original thrust? Well, it was kind of interesting to me that in the very late 80s and early 90s, as I was getting a little bit more onto the industrial side of things, that um, when I went out to LA for the first time, um, I've always seen, at least at the time, I began to see that the West Coast was the place where scenes never died. So although there was no goth scene in the late 80s, early 90s in New York, there was a huge one in LA and San Francisco and to a certain extent, San Diego and possibly Phoenix. And I almost couldn't believe it existed. Um, and so I, 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 in fact, I was a little surprised by it, but there was also a metal scene and a rockabilly scene and there was a vintage scene or like a, you know, a big band or whatever it was. But it, there was like a little bit of something for everyone there. 
And it, it was a huge part of the culture there that, and it wasn't even, it wasn't even thought of as like a revival scene. So the goth scene that was there in LA was the goth scene that had been there from 10 years before. And this was, let's say the, the modern version of it. But again, it had, it had never gone away. And so I kind of thought that was pretty amazing to me. Yeah. And it was around that time period where I think you start to see goth and industrial kind of happen in the same club. Um, and yeah. maybe a room devoted to one and another room devoted to the other, but you're starting to see the two scenes kind of cross over with each other. Not or a DJ spins one and then a DJ spins the other, but the same night in the same club. I think right. that's quite a bit for sure. And then in LA where they were also really mixing in a lot of new wave. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I, I, I had never really seen that merger before and it, was starting to make a lot of, when you're there, as an outsider looking at it, it was like, wow, this is weird. But then you immerse yourself into it and it started to, it started to really grow on me. Like, well, I do really love Depeche Mode and somehow they do kind of make sense with Front 242 and a Suzy song. Like, so like somehow like all of these things at the time were very, very separate to me, but moving to LA made me realize that it, it, it that it could also all be on the same side of the fence. They're not a million miles apart from each other. Um, so the Cleopatra thing. So uh, to their credit, Cleopatra was got in very early on that, what I think of at that time period as sort of the second wave. Um, right. and, and, you know, Cleopatra started the label with releasing, re-releasing all of the original Kraftwerk albums and releasing a Motorhead album and releasing a Christian death album. So again, that whole merger, like you wouldn't sure. think normally it works, but in LA it does work. And yeah. so you, it's almost like you're, you're allowed to kind of mix all of those things together. So Cleopatra starts in, I guess it's 30 years now. So it's 92. Um, and I started work, Cleop, uh, so Spawn Ranch puts out a record there in 93. And I start working there in 94, I believe. And they had already done some compilations like Industrial Revolution. Um, they had already done In Goth Days. There were a few other compilations that they had done at that time period. The Gothic Rock ones that Mick Mercer did, but those were, they were just distributing those, I guess. Yeah. Um, Quite a few uh, tribute albums. I remember those were very big for me from Cleopatra back in the day where they'd do a Depeche Mode tribute album and then they'd have 12 or 13 new bands you didn't know that then you'd find out about do a Depeche Mode cover, whether it was Switchblade Symphony or Raised in Black or a lot of those people that... Now the big wave of those was a little later, but you're right, there was a Sisters tribute. There were a few in the early 93, 94 days. And by 95, they started doing a lot more of them. Yeah. So there was, you know, Dead Can Dance and The Mission and all of these. And so... Um, that that's a whole other story too but i mean again you know spawn ranch was on a lot of those i even resurrected fahrenheit to be on a few of them um and so we fahrenheit did a song on the um the bauhaus tribute um so that with eva O. Oh, um so that was a good one but uh but i but being at cleopatra and learning from the way cleopatra was doing things at the time i i realized that i think i wanted to start to tackle some of these compilations mm -hmm. and so Cleopatra allowed me to kind of, I mean, I, I came up with the idea that the first big one I did was the goth box. And so uh, that one was a four CD set in a box with some great artwork and a big fold out poster. And, you know, again, these kind of compilations, they, they, they take a lot of time. There's a lot of details. And back then, especially because you're doing it on paste up boards and you know, they really, it was sort of before SciQuest and all of those different things that we started doing things on computers a little later with graphics. So it was all very organic in some ways. Um, and so the goth box led to the black Bible. And I, I that's another compilation. I brought in even a little bit more industrial um, and, uh, and some more experimental music on that. That was also a four CD set, big oblong, like uh, almost like a book. It was meant to look like a Bible. Um, so that might have been 90, Goth Box 96, Black Bible maybe 97. And the Unquiet Grave kind of came about. Um, this is a story I do like telling. Yeah. Um, so 
when I was in Fahrenheit, some, let's say 10, 12 years before that, maybe even more, um, I was sending out demo cassettes trying to get the band a record deal. So this is 1985, let's say. And at the time we were getting no interest. And most of the labels in New York were kind of scattered labels, just putting out alternative music. And like I said earlier, it was a bit of a free for all. You could put out like a funky kind of hip hop record. And then you could also put out a post-punk record. Labels were doing all different kinds of stuff. Sure. Um, but our music was, you know, again, a lot of the labels just weren't interested. And there was one label in particular that I had sent a demo to and I called. And so here I am like a 20 year old kid at this point, maybe I still, no, I wasn't 19, I was probably 20 by this point. And I'm learning how to do things. I'm learning how to like promote, get the song on the radio, college radio, fanzines. I'm learning all of this stuff because I had nobody to do it for me. And it's really, I didn't want to do it, but there was nobody else to do it. So I had to learn how to do it. And again, different time period. Oh um, yeah. At, there, were even, there was even a little store in the East Village in New York, in, in Greenwich Village, that the entire store was just fanzines. I mean, to imagine a time period where an entire store was yeah. just fanzines. Yeah. Like, and that they was made such a big deal for a while. That it's so weird. I mean, our blog, Songs and Shadows, and how it's grown, and music review pages, and things like that coming out again digitally. But there was a time when those were gold. They were such a big deal that it, it was like church. You would run and get these or have them sent to your house. And it was, it was the only way to learn more about people that weren't in your town, you know, and True. feel connected, feel as though I am not the only dude out here in eyeliner in the middle of Velveeta Valley, Michigan. You know, there, there are other people in the world just like me that feel like this. And it was a big deal. And it's interesting you say that because Cleopatra did figure out a way, um, again, to understand that there were a lot of you out there. And so um, I don't think that, you know, there was Project right around the same time period. So, so I mean, there were other labels. There's a few other, yeah. That were there were a few others in, that were sort of part of that of that next wave. I mean, there were the original ones like 4AD and Beggar's Banquet, but sure. they didn't even that they they specialized in dark music almost only by accident. Because again, they 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 changed, they switched gears and were signing all different kinds of alternative bands after that. But, but they like ended Beggar's up Banquet had, yeah, like uh Andrew Eldridge, he wouldn't even consider himself he'd get mad if you'd say that. He oh, thought yeah. of them as a rock label and he was a rock band on a rock label, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah, he was, he's always been, he's always been that guy. But um, so going back to the early days of Fahrenheit, when I'm sending out demos, there was a label that I, I sent the demos to. And again, like I said, I sent them to a lot of labels and I would follow up with a phone call. If you can actually such a different time period, but I would actually call the individual. I'd say, Hey, you know, my name's Ethan. I send you a demo tape. The band's Fahrenheit 451. And I got this guy on the phone and he, he had no personality and he almost sounded like I was bothering him. In fact, I probably was bothering him. I said, Hey, did you get the tape? What'd you think of it? Not much. <laughs> and I said, is, Oh, okay. Um, can you recommend anyone else? Maybe I could, I could send it to, or, or, or maybe that I can go to no. And he hung up on me. And for some reason it, it really hurt. I mean, again, sure. it just in that particular moment, it really hurt me. And um, again, like, I mean, I, I wasn't like I was going to quit, but right. um, I but hear you. Oh. Total rejection. Yeah. And I had gotten it before. And so that had led up to this one being a, a big one for me. But the guy really was an asshole. And right. again, like, it's not his responsibility that this kid is calling up. But again, yeah. I'm a human being, you know, and so it's like, and I'm, I'm somebody making music. It's not like it's, I mean, you may find it, you as in this individual may have found it uh, uh, illegitimate, but it's yeah. legitimate to somebody else. So. I put effort and real heart into this. And yeah, I mean, I, I hear you 100%. And I think that's something a lot of, every band ever, I'm sure, can relate to that at one point or another. Well, it taught me a great lesson um, at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, I kind of had this like, uh, this moment of if I'm ever in a position where I can actually help bands one yeah. day, I'm gonna 
I promised myself because of what just transpired, I'm going to do that. And so in a lot of ways, it, it, it helped me uh, to move further. And then many years later, and Fahrenheit, we had our days, we had our times. And then here I am years later, I'm in Spawn Ranch, I'm at Cleopatra. I'm meeting opening acts on tour um, in, you know, in Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida. And the band's like, hey, uh, you know, any, any, any pointers, any ideas? And, you know, can you take your, my demo back to Cleopatra with you? Like, and there's only so many of those bands that are going to get record deals. Right. So I, I remember talking to Brian Pereira, the, the president of Cleopatra, and saying, hey, I really want to do a compilation of these kind of bands. And I've had this title, The Unquiet Grave, in my head for a really long time. Um, and it's you know an old folk song I had pinched the title of. It was like a creepy folk song from the 15th century. And I always thought it would make a great name for an album or for a compilation. And he said, well, you know, I mean, again, we started to talk about how, you know, again, it's a record label, you know, the bottom line is you, everything's got to be in the black. So how can you make this work financially? And so I got enough bands on that first compilation. I think it was 32 bands, two 16 song CDs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get hardworking bands that were probably or hopefully willing that in their area would do enough work. Right. Um, and would be able to, in theory, at least hold up their end of the bargain and possibly sell a few of these, maybe buy a few of these and sell them at their shows. And it, was a, it ended up being kind of a combination of all of that. And so a lot of the bands on it, you know, would buy a dozen copies or something from the label and sell them at their shows. And they would tell someone. And there were a lot of zines at the time, Sideline and Permission and all these different magazines or zines, I should say that reviewed it. And there were some radio shows that, that played it. And it ended up being this sort of um, grassroots sort of true underground thing where the first, the first volume of The Unquiet Grave has, well, at the time, has no names on it. Um, but there were people that ended up becoming names. You know, there were uh, the, the first volume and the second volume, um, off the top of my head, Rea's Obsession was on it, Bella Morte was on it, um, uh, Voltaire was on a volume of one of them, The Birthday Massacre was on one of the volumes. I think they might have been on the third or fourth volume. So even in all of Android Lust, The Crew Shadows, there were all these bands that were in the early phases of their career and they contributed tracks. And it ended up being a very successful series. And, the first one, I think, sold seven or eight thousand copies. I mean, it was actually pretty incredible at the time. I, the I think that did well it. too. Yeah, I, I think that's just it. Is what you're saying is, you know, to a label like Cleopatra and you pitching it, what could this bring? We're going to let the fans tell you what the next six bands who have a real possibility on your label with their own album and promote are. And and to me, that's what those compilations were. Was there were 32 songs, but six of them you said, I have to find this. I have to look it up. This is, it spoke to me in some way. And I don't think I was alone. And just like you said, those names that kind of rise to the top on their own when you hear them, you never would have had a chance of hearing them any other way unless you happen to be from that town. Right, right. And I think that in this instance, the bands were, I, I don't remember exactly how we did it. I think there was like a buyout or something like that. It was like a small amount, like a not, I think each band got five free copies or something like that. And then, sure. and then some small amount uh, to be on this. And then, you know, Cleopatra obviously had the overhead of pressing and graphic design and mastering and all of that kind of thing. But I wanted to try to figure out a way to make it fair for everyone for Cleopatra so that they could justify doing it for the artists to get the kind of promotion that they needed. And I, and again, it wasn't the first compilation in history. I'm not even pretending right, right. that, but it was the first in some ways I feel like that, remember on the Black Bible and on the goth box, it's Bauhaus, it's legendary pink dots, right. it, you know, it's, it's Virgin Prunes, it's all the big names and a few of the newer up and coming bands like the right. Corp Electies of the World and bands like that and Spawn Ranch too and um, in between. But again, it, there wasn't a lot of room to put a, a band that maybe has never left their, their 
you know, Akron or something like that. But they were still, it doesn't mean that they weren't good. It's just they didn't have the opportunities. And so I felt like I had gotten into a position with Cleopatra where, you know, Spawn Ranch was doing well. My older material was getting attention. And I felt like, and I, I felt like this moment that I wanted to kind of share in some of that success. And so it, it, it just worked. And so there were, I did the first two volumes. Uh, I left Cleopatra in 2000. My replacement, this guy, Jason Myers, did two more volumes. And then the series just kind of stopped. And again, I think it stopped. It had something to do with, you know, obviously the digital world, CDs were dying out in, you know, 03, 04, 05. And so it stopped. And in 2019, for the 20th anniversary of the first volume that came out in 99, I resurrected the series. And so there was another one in 2020. And then um, I finally decided, okay, I think, you know, these, I, coming back to them, I began to realize these are a hell of a lot of work. And so in a lot of ways, like it's, it's, it's a, it's, you know, it's a passion project. 40 contracts and again 40 you know 40 wave files getting sure like getting all of these things all lined up the mastering the artwork and it it's it's a real lot of work so during covid i was planning on doing one for 2021 and then i just thought to myself why don't i just do one big one instead of doing one in 21 and 22 why don't i just do one big one and call it the final chapter and here we are so, I think a lot of people uh, overall felt like those two years just were one 10 year long period of time. So, <laughs> so it makes sense because those two years, 2021, they, they really are. They're just one enormous, long funeral drudge of a year. Yeah, they are. They are. And, 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 in this, it, and, and it just happened that that Procession magazine came along. And uh, I just thought, you know, what, a, you know, I like these guys. I, I want to do some more stuff with these guys. And I, how can I cover as many bases with this final volume as possible? And then I started to talk to them and I involved them. And then, you know, they made suggestions with a lot of the band. So I had some help there, which I kind of needed. Sure. Um, and uh, they brought in uh, uh, Angela Benedict to do the cover, to be the cover model. She's great. And so it just... I wanted to bring as many different elements together with an international cast of bands, um, even some obscure bands from the 80s. And then ironically, I put Fahrenheit 451 on it. So, um, so it's well, really and fruitful. In addition, we'll, we'll get to talking through some of it, but uh, our dear friends from Brooklyn, uh, uh, A Murder of Christ, did a tribute to Fahrenheit 451. Oh, A Cloud, a cloud of Ravens, yes. A Cloud yes. of Ravens, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, which was absolutely wonderful and and i love them and hearing them kind of you know throw that out to you for like you said all the work and putting this together getting to hear that reimagining of your song yeah that was very special and it meant a lot to the band too i sent it to all the members so um and we've done some shows with them they're good people we uh we, we've done things together and so yeah no, know, about the band and they're headed in a great direction too they're a good yeah. band so I love this. We got a lot of history covered here and we and it felt organic. That was fun. You know, even though we talk a lot about the past, let's talk about this in particular. Like I said, I, I did a review and put the article out. Um, but let's start off with, you had this connection with uh, Procession Magazine, which I really love. I mean, there's a few of these now. Uh, Obscure Undead does them. Uh, Procession, they're starting to bring the printed zine back. It kind of makes me hunger. It makes me wonder one of these days if I'll do a Sounds and Shadows uh, printed meme. But put together with them and you put this compilation together, what won into your process? Like you said, you wanted to lift up up and coming bands because we have a post-punk, dark wave, goth, whatever, renaissance happening right now. Like that hadn't in a long time, rather, you know, actors, twin tribes, boot blacks, these bands are becoming a big deal on the overall discussion again. And what kind of led you to find some of the things that you wanted to make sure were heard on this and putting the work into putting it together? 
Well, you know, it's funny. I, I wake up pretty early in the morning and I turn on the computer and I start working and I sit in front of the thing for 10, 12 hours, whatever. And so in the course of the day for, you know, I do, I do promotions for Metropolis, Dependence, some for Cleopatra. I write some liner notes for different labels like Cleopatra. I'm involved in sort of the, the management uh, of a bunch of different bands. And so I, I, I'm involved in so many different ways that I'm, there's, there's a constant source of new bands coming my way. Sure. Um, I'm always looking on Bandcamp. I'm always doing comparisons on things on Spotify. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing and finding out about a lot of music. And again, how that feels. it's another Bowie thing because, it, it, you know, the one thing I, I never, well, uh, slightly off the record, but I won't mention who it is. Um, I was doing publicity for a band a few years ago, and they were asked in an interview if, um, if there's any new music that they're listening to. And they replied with, I'm so busy with my music, I don't have time for new music. And I remember reading that, and uh, I was a little disappointed, to be honest with you. Sure. Um, and to be honest with you, their music kind of sounds like they don't listen to other people's music. And that can be a good thing, but it also can be a bad thing. Because sure. if one thing that I, another thing I learned from Bowie is that Bowie, up until very late in his life, probably even the final months of his life, was still online listening to new music. And he, and even if I don't like it, I still feel like it's my obligation to at least click on things and get a sample of what it's about. Because if I'm going to make fun of some pop music or something like that, at least I want to be able to know what I'm making fun of. Or even if it's, you know, even in our world, I mean, again, it's very easy to do. I mean, you're on Bandcamp, you know, they've got charts, you go on there, click, 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 and you can check out a lot of different things. Yeah. Okay, the reason I brought you down that road is because in the process of all of this, I'm finding out about a lot of music. And so... Uh, I'm, I'm constantly online, I'm constantly looking, you know, at Bandcamp and Spotify. So it, some of these bands kind of came my way, but a lot of them I kind of discovered because I'm just clicking around. Yeah. And so, um, and again, if I, if I see a band that has great graphics and they, you know, you can clearly tell that they're doing their homework, they're out there, they're working hard, they're playing live, they've got good videos, they're in this zine, they're in that zine. I, or, or even uh, I, I cruise a lot of radio playlists because I deal with so many specialty radio shows in the goth industrial dark wave scene, post-punk, that I'm always looking at those charts. Like, oh, that's a cool name, let me check that out. So I'm always doing this and I guess it's all part of, as long as I'm involved in this brand of music, which is probably gonna be the rest of my life at this point, um, I might as well, you know, immerse myself on a daily basis and have it have your and finger know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so I think it's important. Um, I so, agree and, and then, in some ways, there's also another full circle element of this. My hands are flying around. Um, I, sometimes I meet bands that open up for noir. And it's in the same way that I've met bands opening up for Spawn Ranch years ago. So, uh, uh, you know, we played, Noir did a show in Pittsburgh a few years ago. I met Chips in the Night. Um, Great band, love them. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, again, they, they're, 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 that kind of thing tends to happen a lot. Or, you know, bands that we just did a show with and I'll contact them. And, and again, uh, Social Station, a band from DC that I, you know, I only knew because we did a show with. I put them on I believe the 2019 or the 2020 volume. I don't remember exactly, but there's a lot of those kind of instances of bands that I just happen to meet. Um, or I'll reach out to, um, you know, I'll reach out to a label, like somebody like a Jim Simonic and yeah. say, hey, Jim, you've got some bands, you know, I, I'm doing this compilation. Do you have any new up and coming bands? He'll send me some stuff. I'll use a couple of tracks. So it's, it's a lot of that kind of thing. So that's, you know, so again, I, there's always, a, and there's always, and it, this thing is, it's like, even if I, if I ever stop doing these compilations, I'm going to feel bad because where am I going to put all this stuff, you know, so. I, I love that you say that, and especially how it relates to your own music and, and still doing it and making good music. I love that track that you put on there from Noir. I, I hit, it's the first one on, and when I hit play, I remember writing about this in the review and just saying, this was the perfect way to open this, to set the tone for it, 
in terms of your voice, the energy for it. it. It just strikes hard. So the fact that you're still writing music and doing it because another part of listening to bands today, because I do the same thing, I'm playing music, but I'm listening to a lot. If I give any advice to someone who's a writer and lyric writing, the same kind of thing, it's if you're stuck, read great books. If you wanna write well, you need to read great books. You need to go back to the classics. You need to, whether it's Shakespeare or Hemingway or what have you, hear how great writers write. And then when you go to write, you will find your voice getting better. I think listening to music is the exact same thing. Like you need to hear great things done well, whether it's classic or something new that's coming out. If you want to find your own voice, it is important to do that. I, I completely agree. I mean, and again, and then there's also, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, but I think that there are ways, and at least I've tried to do this. I mean, originally I wanted to be an actor. And so I had to kind of make a decision, like, is it going to be music or is it going to be acting? Sure. And then I decided that, you know, music would be at least something I can hit the ground running and start working immediately. Acting, again, you're auditioning, you're hoping, you're doing these different things. But at least with a band, you can play, you can start rehearsing, you can get a gig. I mean, acting, I guess, isn't all that different. But, but again, you can build on that. Acting tends to be sort of all or nothing. Um, but again, I love film. I love 30s, 40s, 50s films. I love modern films. I, I love a lot of literature, a lot of poetry. And I, I figured with music that one thing that I've always tried to do is bring all of those worlds together. And so whether it's in the graphics or whether it's actually in the lyrics or in the approach or the imagery or anything like that, I borrow from a lot of those other different forms of, you know, of the arts and I bring them into what I'm doing in a way because I can't necessarily make movies. So I can at least draw them into what I'm doing. I can't necessarily sit down and, and write like John Steinbeck or Poe, but I can bring in elements of that to what I'm doing. So I've always tried to do that and learn from them at the same time. And in this day and age, look, that's been a part of it for a while now. If, if you're putting out a new song or something like that, frankly, if you don't have a video, on YouTube or say, you're nowhere with it. Um, you know, and there's a lot of bands, uh, Crying Vessel, you know, one of my favorite in the dark wave scene that does this, spends so much time, you know, Slade on the videos and the matching up the imagery to the music. And a lot of the most successful bands are doing that. It is an integral part at this point. You have to do both and have them connect. I, I agree, together. yes, very much so. So the, the last question that I want to ask, because, man, we, we have just been firing through. We talked for like an hour just now, and oh, that was wow. awesome. I love it. I took my glasses off, so I can't even see what time it is. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's great. I want to ask you specifically, we put out an article not that long ago in Sounds and Shadows about doing musical promotion in 2021. And I had a lot of people, uh, Jason Corbett, actors, um, or uh, Vision Video, Dusty, a, a lot of people chime in that I feel like have done something unique to promote themselves in the modern age. As someone who does this and has done it for multiple decades where you've kind of seen the game change, what advice would you give to new bands in order to properly find your audience online in 2022? Well, online, socials, and, and let's say as a whole, um, it's a huge part of the game. There's no two ways about it. But it's still, even if it's 60 or 70% of the pie, it's, there still are some other things too that you need to kind of, I mean, if there's one thing that I do tell bands, like it's multiple irons in the fire at the same time. Oh, yeah. You've got to be on top of the socials. And again, in, in, and you have to be on top of everything that, that kind of exists online, whether it's Facebook or and anything. I mean, you, you just have to be constantly involved in that. But you I need to also have something to offer to begin with. You know, I mean, it, again, sometimes, you know, having great social skills 
in, it it all reminds me of years ago, like in the in the eighties and nineties, bands would brag that you know they have a manager or an entertainment lawyer, but they didn't even have songs yet. So you can't put the carpet for the horse. You do have to have, you know, you do have to have these things. Now, again, having a great video is great, but you also have to know what to do with it. And so again, that's where you know that's obviously where all the you know social skills and whatnot do come into play. I think that playing live is an important part of the piece of the pie too. Um, I think that understanding the business of music, even just a little bit, understanding publishing, how it works, um, and uh, I think that those things are really important. Understanding touring and how to you know do it on a shoestring budget, even if it's even if you just start out with doing weekends and you and again there's really no money in it so uh, again you have to get kind of used to that um you know even you know i like to tell this story about in the early year the spawn ranch's first tour um in 93 i guess was it 93 i guess it was 93 um we did 30 50 dollar shows and so, and there were three of us and we did a lot, of, we slept in the van a lot. And, sure. and so uh, again, early on, you have to really spend to make, there's no two ways about it. You have to be able to devote yourself to that. It will get better eventually if you get better. Um, so, I mean, those things are all things that you have to think about. And you have to think about even, even the, the way that I, I've talked about you know doing the unquiet grave. You want to surround yourself with like-minded people um, right. that are willing to do the work and that you can be around a lot. Um, and so you know, band with. Yeah, that's what. Again, you're going to end up spending a lot of time with these individuals, and you have to like them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really important. Um, and there's just a lot of sacrifices and compromises you have to make. Um, if you're going to do this and be really serious about it. I mean, you know, relationships suffer, family life suffers, a lot of these kind of things. And you're watching, you know, you're in your 20s, let's say, and you're watching other friends, you know, go off and have kids and buy houses and do adult stuff. And you're touring and, you know, and, and you know, living on pizza. And, yeah. uh, and so you have to be able to make those kind of sacrifices. I think that those things are really important. Um, but again, I mean, even just, but getting back to even just, let's just say, we'll use Bandcamp as an example. Sure. I think it's important for bands to pay attention to what the bands that they respect or they look up to are doing. So let's say you made a good example of, of actors. Now, no one can necessarily follow directly in their footsteps, but if you're a fan of the band and you admire their success and this and that kind of thing, do some research, find out what led them to that. Well, whether it's them or any band, but what led them to, 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 you know, to, the, to the path that they chose and, and how can you do a version of that for yourself? Mm -hmm. So even if, even if it's a, you know, there are plenty of bands that never play live that are really just bedroom projects. I mean, and if you wanna be that, you can be that. But again, if you're gonna be that, um, it's important that you have video as well. So, I mean, again, video can end up being your live band in a way. I mean, or the closest thing like to performance that, that, uh, that, that uh, visually that people can see. Um, so no, I, I think the example you give there with actors, I, when I did that article and talked about it, I think one of the lightning in a bottle things they captured that was wonderful is they toured more than anybody at that time. They were playing all over nonstop over the whole world. But beyond that, unlike the idea of in the 90s or 80s, the aloof rock star with attitude and dis, they walked up to everyone, let you say hello, shook your hand, signed your album, smiled. They, they just had that glowing warm energy and worked the hell out of it, touring all over. The and that's the magic in a bottle they captured because I, I do think that that's a big idea. Point. I, yeah. you know, I was on a I was on a panel at um, Dark Side of the Con. It felt, I think it was a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. I forgot when it was, but uh, on this panel with Steve and Donna from Ego Like This, sure. And um, somebody in the audience asked, like, you know, how did you get your start? And you know, can you give any advice? And and I think Steve, <laughs> Steve went up to the microphone and said, Yeah, don't be a dick. And so, but I mean, it was a brief response, 
but he did it, it, it there's a great point there in my opinion like don't it, it, don't again I, I i've talked about this for a long time and it, it has a lot to do with even my early days um when i finally managed to get parts of my ego in check sure. um, but uh, we all struggle with that but i mean again don't be an asshole right. don't burn bridges try to you know be diplomatic try to you know make friends and and try not to get involved in the pettiness and and you know the tr uh, the trivial side of of these things and these battles and these sort of competitions. I mean, we're not gangs; we're bands, you know. And so it's it's um, there's it's and it's, it's a little bit of something for all of us. I mean, again, yeah. it's a big tent; we can all fit underneath of it. It's it's like politics almost. Like yeah. learn how to reach across the aisle. I mean, you know, I know that even right now that you know, again, we're talking about a lot of these bands and in dark music, we do kind of have two kind of scenes going on at the same time. We've got sort of the ongoing traditional goth industrial scene that's kind of always been around, let's say the last 35 some odd years. And we've got kind of this newer sort of indie flavor, dark wave thing that comes a little bit more from the indie side of things. But, you know, it's post-punk and there's a little bit more guitar bass, but there's synths and, and they cross over sometimes. But I think that try to figure out a way to appeal to both sides of that coin. You know, I, 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 I don't, you don't, and, and again, artists don't want to have to think about these kind of things, um, but you kind of have to think about these things. Yeah. Or somebody in the band has to be the person to think about these things because there, I, there's, there's no, how should I say, there may come a time when you can be exclusively an artist and sit around barefoot and, you know, write on the hammock all day long, and, you know, write lyrics and paint and do what you want. And, you know, the, the rent, but, but again, like you gotta eat. So um, you have to figure out how to kind of do this from, look at this from all sides. This has been a total pleasure. I honestly, we could do a whole other interview on top of this one where I would love to talk to you longer about it, but we're, we're coming to the end here. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you a really hard question now okay. because this would be a hard one for me. I'm going to have a drink of water for the hard one. Yeah. Getting this, this is the hardball question. Serious stuff here. Okay. Um, when you think of the, you know, new procession magazines, the unquiet grave, the final chapter, what are two or three bands that you didn't really know before putting this out that that you found that you want to give a shout out to you that you feel are are special as someone who has an ear for this and has for a while um that that you want to give a shout out to to make sure people are spinning this and giving a listen to uh well that's a good one um okay so because uh, there's a ton that's great, and we should listen are. to all of it, every, obviously. But in particular, you probably knew or heard a lot of these. But I want you to think hard of a couple that walking in the door, you didn't know anything about this, and you were like, yes. Okay, the first one, I'm not even sure how to pronounce their name, um, but I kind of stumbled into them in the process of putting this together. Diavol Strain, I think they're from Chile. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah, they're a really good uh, female duo, um, and again, really good band, and I was really happy that they decided to be on the compilation. You familiar with them? Yes. It, yeah. I, I've had a big thing in my heart lately, and Cleopatra has always been really good about this, actually, but the Latin and, you know, dark wave post-punk scene is criminally undercovered and underrated. And so I love that that was included and just a very cool band. I think they did the Oscura Festival that we did too, but just- They have had some, they, they've come to the States. Um, they, they have done a little bit of touring. I did, I did yeah. notice that. Um, this one was streaming. It wasn't, they had to actually come here, but okay. I think they did a streaming set for it. But they were on, I think they were on the West Coast recently. I know they had, I, because I, I, I remember trying to get in touch with them a few months back. It might have been towards the, you know, in the contractual phase of the yeah. Unquiet Grave. So they're a great example of, of, of a band that I probably wouldn't have stumbled upon, but maybe, but either way, I, I, I not only yeah. stumbled upon them, but I had a, a purpose with them. 
to put them on this compilation. Yes. Um, I like Attic Frost a lot. I think they're really good. Very cool. Uh, you know, they, they, again, a real good sort of a, you know, mysterious band. Uh, they're German. Um, and uh, I, I think that they're a really good band. Um, and give a shout out to them. Bedless Bones, I think they're really great. My favorite band from Estonia. I think she's from yeah, Estonia. This, yeah. You know, I, I think the thing I always say, like she did a, a band I really like and cover uh, uh, I Am The Shadow with Pedro Code. Ah, another good band, yeah. Yeah, she did a duet with him. And everything she does, the cadence of her voice always hits me because for whatever reason, maybe it's the accent or what have you, it just kind of stands out because it sounds different than the, the timing or tempo or breath that everybody else sings in. Absolutely love Kadri, uh, like just super cool voice. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, again, you know, of course I mentioned the Cloud of Ravens. Uh, you know, I, I wanted, I, I mean, again, they did the Fahrenheit song and it was their idea. So I was very, very, very honored by that. So I was happy to have them on there. Um, uh, Eric from Adoration Destroyed, of course, is on there. Another, you know, I mean, again, I've been working on and off with Eric for, for a long time now, about five, six years. And, and so, a great videographer now. He's And uh, his new wife, uh, Eva X, Gabby. Uh, has he's also on the compilation too. So again, um, uh, there's, I'm trying to think of this. Ah, there's a, a band from New York that called Like What. I, I did not, I just stumbled upon them. And again, good creative, more of a bedroom project. But again, right here in New York, right under my nose. But I found them on Bandcamp. Um, so there's a lot of bands like that on this collab. Oh, The Veil. I mean, that's a Very band cool. from the 80s. And again, that um, I remember hearing about back then. I didn't know. Um, and uh, oddly enough, I reached out to them. You know, here it is all these years later. That, that material is from like 1987 or something like that. Um, and I was able to get them to be on The Unquiet Graves. So there's, there's a few 80s bands like that. So... Yeah, there's some great stuff on there. I'm I'm really proud of it. I I you know I think and it's already had an impact. It's done very well. It's been in the top of the charts. So I'm very happy with that. So we're going to now spin out to a song here, um, and you've listed a bunch of great ones that that everyone should listen to. And usually I let the guests pick, but because there's so many, and you chose all of these songs, <laughs> I'm going to pick one that I had never heard before or heard of until I listened to the comp that I want to spin out to that I think everyone should check out. And it was Byronic Sex and X style. A good band, yeah. Your name on the wind. I was blown away. That was absolutely fantastic. I didn't know anything about them and went and looked up afterwards because that's what a compilation like this can do. Um, for all you out there in interweb land, uh, it, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for talking to mm -hmm. us. And I look forward to see what you have coming up and going forward. And everyone needs to go check out this compilation. And heck, if, if you didn't come into the scene until later, go back and find those old Clio comps because they will give you the best rewind of understanding where goth post-punk dark wave history came from. Um, so from all of us out here at Sounds and Shadows, keep it dark, yo, and have a wonderful evening.
Yeah.